Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. This morning I was uh, preparing my sermon. I, I thought I was thinking of uh, singing also a song and it flashed to my mind to sing people in the Lord. But then I thought by myself, well, I sing it so often. Well, let me not sing that song. And so I tried another song, but it did not work out. So I said, well, I just not let me sing. But the Lord is good. And He provided. And still we heard people need the Lord. Amen. Amen. And uh, I can tell you, I, I was listening to the song just now, and, and it was just as if I had never heard this song in this, in this way, you know. And, and it was really nice. It was really nice. Thank you. Uh, shall we need now to have a word of prayer? Precious God and Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we come before your throne of mercy, asking your blessing for this morning as we open your word and listen to your word of truth. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you may endow us with your Holy Spirit and empty our hearts from all sin. And we pray, oh, Heavenly Father, that our minds will be filled with your word of truth of salvation. And we will pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will guide us into your word. Oh, Lord, here we are asking you to bless us and to forgive our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. It was in the year 1850 that the young man, then unknown, walked in the streets of London on a Sunday morning. Indeed, he was also an empty man like you and me are often empty and looking for rest and peace in our minds and hearts. And when he was wandering there in the streets of London, he passed by a Methodist church and the doors were open and he saw people sitting there in the pews and he heard a young preacher preaching a sermon on the text we just read in the book of Isaiah 45 verse 22 look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else you know when he heard that young preacher that late preacher it was not really a letter preacher it was a young man filling up the gap and when he entered the pulpit he focused on that Bible verse in Isaiah 45 verse 22 it was not a man of many words it was probably just a short sermon but one thing Spurgeon noticed is that in this Bible first he found his hope and salvation and this brought this young man into the church this Bible first brought him on the path which leads to the throne of God and this unknown young man called Charles, Charles Spurgeon became one of the most famous, well-known revivalists in the 19th century. So you can see what God can do. We have a marvelous God. We have a God who can make something out of nothing. He can make out of a sinner, he can make a saint. This is a God we serve. Look unto me, the Bible says, and be saved. All the ends of the words, not one example. Salvation is for all of us. No matter your background, where you come from, your culture, your color, it doesn't matter. God is there for you and He's there to save you through Jesus Christ. 
thank God that this preacher, this lay preacher, had not a sermon made of many words, but this gave Charles Spurgeon the opportunity to remember those three words, look unto me, look unto me, and be ye saved. And it gave him so much power, so much hope, so much comfort that he gave his life to the Lord and he decided to work in the vineyard of the Lord until he died. In John 6 verse 40, the Bible says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believe on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. And in John 3 verse 14, the Bible says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up. If you lift up somebody, you are exalting somebody. You making him elevate. You put him on the spot. You highlight him. This is what we ought to do as Christians. Looking unto Jesus and make him great. And we do that. Not only by looking at him, but by reflecting the light which Jesus is sending to us to others. Because that is our commission, why God has called us in this fallen world, right before His coming. Knowing Jesus, lifting Him up, there's nothing more, there's nothing else what we need more to do today. Reflecting Christ. And the reason for that is because there is no other name by which we are being saved. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Lift him up. Lift up the name of Jesus. Not only for myself, not only for yourself, but for all of them. For all who are wandering in this wilderness called earth and who are seeking for peace seeking for rest and haven't found it yet we are commissioned by the Lord to preach the everlasting gospel and we all know that the Seventh-day Adventists preaching the everlasting gospel not only by word but especially in the way we act the way we behave the way we appear looking unto Jesus looking in the mirror of truth will change us because the Bible says by beholding we will become changed this morning is Christ who is speaking this morning who says to us it was me who was in the garden full of agony it was me who poured out my soul into death it was me who hung on the tree on the cross of Calvary it was me who died for sinners like you and me Jesus Jesus, the name Jesus, God saves, died for us, with a curse for us, so that we may have eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? And you know, looking unto Jesus, looking unto Him who died for us, is the only thing what we have to do. But because by doing this, by looking unto Him, we will be changed. That's God's promise. You know, everybody can look. So simple is the gospel. Everybody can look. Even the most illiterate of us, he can look. Even the greatest fool among us can look. Everybody can look. No matter how weak, no matter how poor you think you are, you can look unto Jesus. He will make you rich. He will do it. Not in money, but in life. Eternal life. This is the God we serve. Promises looking unto Jesus. I will repeat this many, many times because so that you will keep this in your mind. That by looking, by beholding, we become changed. Because this is that great passage in God's Word by which Charles Spurgeon, that unknown, simple guy who was walking and wandering through the streets of London, made him a saint. 
in Christ Jesus and made him a worker for Christ in his vineyard. And we need to understand that Spurgeon's experience does not stand alone. We all were wandering in the wilderness. We all need Christ. We all were seeking for rest and peace of mind. And Jesus is calling today, all those who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke. It's not a heavy, because I did it all for you. And this man, Charles, Charles uh, Spurgeon, he was brought face to face with Christ. He was shown his own condition. He understand what, why he needed Jesus Christ. And when he heard that sweet voice of Jesus preached by that layman preacher on that pulpit in the Methodist church, he was touched by it. And he heard it. He, he heard the beautiful word of salvation and he believed it. And he knew that he was saved. You know, sometimes we make the doctrine of salvation so very complicated. While it is so simple. So simple. We are using words which people outside the church are not familiar with. You know, we use words and phrases like saved, uh, uh, blood, uh, blood bought. We, we say blood washed, born again. We say redeemed. All these kind of words which people outside do not understand. It is so simple. Look unto Jesus and be saved. There is no other name by which we are saved. Now, what, that, that word salvation, you know where does it come from? Salvation, what does it mean? Uh, God's name, I mean Jesus' name, means God saves. And there's no other name by which we are being saved. Now, what is that salvation? It's the act of being saved from harm. Now, the harm which we are all experiences is the result of sin. And God came there to rescue us. God came there down to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ to deliver us from it. Deliver us from death. This is also your experience when you met Jesus. What was your experience when you met Jesus? You know, years ago, before I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I was a bus driver. And somehow I was brought into contact with Christ through a Muslim. I got a flyer and I was brought to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I didn't know anything about the Bible, but I got interested in the Bible. The church told me all about Jesus. And the church helped me to study. I bought a Bible that time. A good use Bible. Very simple Bible in simple Dutch. Because I couldn't understand the King James or the Start of Italy. It was difficult for me. So I began to read the New Testament, the Good News Bible. I read it from calf to calf. And the only thing what I understood, very simple. I'm a sinner, but I can be a sinner saved by grace. What I need is Jesus. That's the only thing I knew that time. But that is enough. Because gradually the Lord will tell you more and more. He will reveal himself to you. You will grow in grace. You will grow in Christ. You become more like Christ. Because that is the objective of the gospel. You become like him. Christ-like. And then you begin to understand. What it is. To be with Jesus. You know, when we think of salvation, sometimes we think of salvation about the earthly salvation. We can be saved physically, mentally, emotionally, all these kind of things. But these are all kinds of salvation which is temporary for this day, for this day, for this, this time, for this earth. But the salvation with God is giving us is going far beyond it 
It helps us to survive even in, in, in eternity. And God will, wants to bring us there if ever we look unto Him. And talk about the spiritual needs we, we have. Some people do not experience that. They think it's, everything is alright. But when you look unto Jesus, when you look in the mirror of His love, you see that there is nothing quite right with us. It only comes through God's plan of salvation that we are saved, that we will be rescued from, from the situation where we are into. Salvation cannot be obtained by good deeds, it cannot be obtained by clean living, it only comes by the way which God has set before our eyes, the way which leads to the throne of God, the way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And Jesus' way is the only avenue which brings us to the door of heaven. Someone said, if a man have a million dollars, or a man must, must have a million dollars, to be called a millionaire. If we compare it to us, we must have Christ if ever we want to be Christian. The Bible says, He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. A person goes to heaven only by a, having a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus. There's nothing else that can bring us there. No good deeds. No knowledge of the Bible. Or not, not by trying to do right. The only way to enter heaven is having that relationship with Christ. And you can only do that when you're studying His Word. When you look unto Him the way how He does it, we should do. I wrote here one reason why I will be going to heaven is because one day in the past I looked unto Jesus. One day in the past, but it didn't stop there. One day in the past it was Jesus who forgave my sins. But if we do not keep on looking to Jesus, it will not avail us. We must look unto Jesus till He comes again. That is the only way. We should stop trying to do what has already been done. We should do the works of Christ. If we are looking at the Christ, if we allow Him to let His light shine on us, we will automatically reflect His light. It says here in Hebrew 2 verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should take death for every man brothers and sisters the cross of Jesus is the proof of God that he loves us it says here but God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us would we die for an enemy? Would we die for somebody who has done us harm? Well, I think I have to think twice whenever I will do that. We would not do that so easily. We would die perhaps for our friends, but we would not die for our enemies. But remember, Jesus is different. He died for us while we were sinners. He died for us when we were enemies. He did it all for us. And if we have that picture in mind, the love of God, then we will finally humble ourselves and say, thank you, Jesus, that you did for us. Please give me the power to do the same for my enemies. And enemies we have. There are many, many in this world. In John 6, verse 37, the Bible says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. 
So, God did it for us. God is asking us now to act upon what He did for us. If we answer God, if we reply to what He is asking, if we connect ourselves to Him, He will do in us what we cannot do. And that is the word He already did for us. What He has done, He gave it to us. And His words are perfect. Jesus says, For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of Him that sent me. You know, there is one thing God has given to us. It's very small, and God cannot touch it, and the devil cannot. The only thing is, we can apply it. And it is that small rudder which moves the whole ship, a whole human life. And that is the will, which is very, very important. And if we set our will towards to Jesus and say like Jesus, how we pray, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. We have to set aside what we want, what we find important in this world and allow God to let him do his will in us. That's not easy. Because the natural man is tend to do his own will, make his own decisions. Do what he likes, do what he wants, do what he thinks is good for him. But if we act like that, we are just blind and deaf at the same time. We don't know our own heart. So therefore it's better when the Lord speaks to us, act upon it and do it. And if you cannot, nobody can. If we allow him, then we can. In Romans 10 verse 30, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that very simple? I'm not saying that what God has done for us was simple. I'm saying that what God is offering us to come back to Him, it's very simple. We have to look up to Jesus, to call on His name, and we are saved. But don't stop, stop there. Keep on looking, keep on calling, every day, in and out. And you'll be saved. You'll be able to make it. If we want to have rest and peace in our hearts, then look unto Jesus and call unto Him. The fact of the matter is this, anyone can look. Anyone can call. The question is, have you set your will to it? Have you looked unto Jesus? Have you called and depend on His holy name? Have you? That's the question. And even more important, will you? Will you look unto Jesus? Will you force yourself to look unto Him? Are you asking power to receive power from God? Because that's what we need. I would like to, you to open your Bibles to the book of Psalms. Let's first start in Psalms 51. Here you find David speaking. You find here praying, praying for forgiveness. You will find him here confessing his sins. And he starts with saying, Lord, have mercy on me. In fact, he is saying, Lord, that which I deserve, please don't let it happen. Have mercy on me. And that which David acknowledged what he deserved, is losing his eternal life. He said, Lord, let it pass by. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. And then he says, Blot out my transgressions. Forgiveness is not enough. 
Because it will still be there. Written. He says, no. Blot it out. Wipe it away. As if it has never been there. This is asking. And you can see here that he's not asking for favors of the Lord. He's also doing something in return. And that which we also do in return. And that is namely to tell it all to Jesus. Because he says here, blot out my transgressions. He's telling God, look, this is how I am. This is what I did. I've been a murderer. I've been an adulterer. I've done everything what was against you. So please, forgive me. Have mercy on me. Blot out my sins. Wash, wash me. Truly for my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. And the reason for that is, you know why he's saying this? You know, you find in verse 3, it says here, For, now you get the answer, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sins is ever before me. David was a man who saw who he was, who he really was. He was probably one of the most rich men of the, the, of, of the world. He was the most powerful man of the world. He was a king of a kingdom. And still he made himself from very high, from very great, to very low and very humble. And he said, Lord, here I am. Take me as I am. And the only thing what we can give God... The only thing what we can give him return to his mercy and grace is our sins because he has bought us with a price. When we keep what belongs to God, it makes us a thief. So this is what David understood. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. And be clear when thou judges. And then he says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. You know, we are so focused on the outward part. We, we come to church, put on our nicest clothes, you know, make our hair nicely. I have no hair, many of us not, but some of us have, especially the, the women among us. And they make ourselves beautiful, all kind of arrays and costly things. We put on a nice watch because we go to church. We, we sh shine our shoes and look, here I am. Who are you? I'm a seventh Adventist. Can't you see it? The outward part. But God is looking on the inward part. The inward part should shine and be cleansed from all unrighteousness. The people will see it. Don't worry. The people will see you. The people will see you because they are a little bit different than you are. And not because of your earrings, not because of your lipstick, not because of your short, short uh, dresses and your shiny shoes and your, your nice suit. No. They will see it because Jesus is there. It is Jesus who reflects himself in you and through you to the other who don't know you yet. It's no use to dress yourself like the world. It's no use. Because the people will see no difference, is it? So behold, thou desirest truths in the inner parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me know wisdom, even in the hidden parts. Things we do not know ourselves, we should ask God, Lord, help me. Tell me who I really am. You know, during the years, I, I, I didn't know that I could, got, that I could go, get angry. And I, I never got angry when I was young. I was smiling and laughing all, about everything. And, and everything was fine. People could treat me bad. And I would not get angry. Until one day it happened. I said, what? I look in the mirror. Is it really me? Yes, it's me. And, and I can tell you, I discovered many more things because the Lord has revealed to me of which I never knew I could do it. But the Lord wants to cleanse us. That means if He wants to, us to be pure, He has to dig deep 
in the inner part, in the hidden part of your heart, your mind. So the wife says, do not listen to the enemy's suggestions to stay away from Christ until you have made yourself better. Some people, you know, I spoke to a colleague, I'm not going to church anymore. I will not do it. I said, why? Because I do not act like a Seventh-day Adventist. I smoke. I drink. I do not read the Bible anymore. I do all kinds of things. I'm shooting, you know, I like to shoot for sport. But he said, oh, the times, the, the times are getting worse and worse. And oh no, oh no, if something happened, I have already something to defend myself. If they come, I will shoot. I said, wow, where does it lead to? He didn't know Christ. He didn't, know, he didn't understand the need for coming to church. Nobody to shun away from this building, from the church. The fellowship that we have with each other. Nobody should shun away. Nobody should be shy for Jesus. Because he knows it all even before you know it. He knows it all before you know what is in your heart. He knows it. And he's going to tell it to you. If you want to. Sometimes if you even don't want to. If you open your heart for him. If you allow him with the spirit to guide you on that path which leads to the throne of God. He will bring you back again. Dare to look unto Jesus. There, have the guts, and you'll be changed. The, people, the, the devil wants to make us believe that we are not good enough. No, we, and he's right. So somehow he's speaking the truth. But at the same time, he's trying to close the doors. Making you think that you're not welcome anymore. Because you've done a lot of things in your life which are contrary to the word of God. I'm one of them. And maybe there are some. I don't know. We do the same. We experience the same. And Satan points to your filthy garments. Repeat the promise of God. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And that would be a marvelous, wonderful God. That we can come to Him just as we are, no matter what we have done, no matter our backgrounds. We ought to remember that David was a murderer. He was an adulterer. And who knows how many other things he has done. And God says, I will not cast you out. He became a man of God. Like you and me can become a man of God. If we allow him and we look up to Jesus the way he is, and to look up to ourselves in the mirror of love and of righteousness, to who we really are and should not be. This house is a house of prayer. This house is a house of going on your knees and plead with God, save me, Lord, Amen. have mercy upon me. We must tell the enemy that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Make the prayer of David your own. You know, I, I try to look at another psalm in 32, Psalm 32, where it says, David sings blessings of forgiveness. You know, usually when we sing, sometimes somebody dies, we sing, that's true. Sometimes when we mourn, we sing, that's also true. But most of the time we sing because we are happy. That's why it says here, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sins, his sin is covered. Blessed is he. Blessed is another word for happiness. Happy is he whose sins are forgiven, who are given away. Give it to Jesus, because it is the only one who can bear them. Amen. Blessed. 
Well, I can tell you, I'm, 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 if I have committed sin, a load of guilt is on me. A load of guilt. And sometimes, you know, we are listening to Satan who says, shh, shh, God will never forgive. You are so bad. He, you are the worst. And it's true. You know, every saint says, look, like Paul, I'm the worst of sinners. That's what a Christian should be. Paul is an example for all of us. We all are the worst. Because every sin, even unknown sin, which is there, but of, you, of which you do not know, is there. And causes us to die forever. And Jesus, dying on the cross for us. Jesus, being a curse for us, made a curse for us. He says, come my son, come my daughter, and I will give you rest. Oh, how happy we will be when sins will be forgiven. If ever we dare to tell it all to Jesus. Not to your neighbor, not to, your, to whoever here in the church. No need unless you have to commit something against the person itself. But if you go to God, tell it all. Don't be shy. Because this will save you. first verse in, in, in Psalm 32 is a promise. The promise is that blessed is he who transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And if you skip a few lines it, in verse 5, it says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. Here again, David again speaking. When he comes for the Lord, he asking for a favor, he asking to bless him, he asking to make him happy again. But the Lord says, not without confessing your sins. Then David acted upon it and he says, I acknowledge. Lord, I can't deny it. I did it. Don't make a detour. Straight way. Because the way to heaven is straight. It's a narrow path. And my iniquity have I not hid? You see, he didn't hide anything. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee. Everyone who wants to be godly. Who wants to be godlike. Who wants to be Christ-like. Will do this first. And that's a requirement, I would like to say, for being saved. The requirement is confession your sins. Then we will be blessed. It says here, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. That's the promise. If ever we follow Jesus. I will end with a quotation of Sister White. The heading is the depths of David's repentance. How deep did he go? You know, I can tell you how deep David goes or went. Because the Bible says everybody who comes to God must come with a contrite heart. And you know, a contrite heart is a heart which is crushed into pieces. In fact, he came there as nothing more than dust. And the only way to come to God, and the only expectation you can have, if God wants to make a change in you, that you come to God, in Jesus' name, as dust. Because dust means that you do not exist anymore. You are crushing your pieces like what God will do, you know, after the thousand years when the whole earth will be cleansed with fire and everything will be made dust again. Nothing left of what was before. This is how we should come to God. As dust. 
Because if you want to be changed, you must allow God to change you. And He can only make clay from you again if you are crushed into dust. dust. Then He will be able to do the miracle which you are asking. David's repentance was sincere and deep. There was no effort to palliate his crime, to make, make it less worse, less bad. No desire to escape the judgments threatened inspired his prayer. But he saw the enormity of his transgressions against God. He saw the defilement of his soul. He loathed his sin. It was not for pardon only that he prayed, but for purity of heart. Because it's not only about the forgiveness of sins, because there will be a record still. It's about a new heart, where there is no sin, the mind of Christ. David did not in despair give over the struggle in the promise of God to repent to repentant sinners he saw the evidence of his pardon and acceptance you know when you give your heart to Jesus when he when you allow him to chisel your heart everything will be all right and I pray this morning that God will give us the power to give our heart to Jesus I'd like to end with a small story short story it's about a man and a, and a boy who were walking across the street and the man who was next to the boy saw him carrying a pot with honey. And of course his mother told him that, look, I want you to bring the honey home, but be careful that you will not waste the honey. And make sure that if ever you get dirty because of the honey, because the pot was full, make sure that you do not try to cleanse your, your hands on your pants or your coat. But somehow it happened, maybe accidentally or purposely, he put his finger in the honey. And he remembered the words from his, of his mother, don't wipe it here. So he thought, well, why shall I put it? Well, the only way where I can put it is my mouth. So he did like that. And the man next to him asked him, he said, what is that boy? He said, that's honey, sir. Oh, I see you're putting it in your mouth. Is it nice? Nice, sir. Thank you. And again, he did it in his mouth. Again, the man asked him next to him, is it, is, it, is it nice what you are eating? It's very nice, sir. Very nice. Okay, but let, let me ask you a question, sir. Uh, you're telling me all the time, it's nice, it's very nice, it's very, very nice. But how can I know that it is nice? And, and the boy got a little bit irritated and upset. He thought by myself, well, let me put it again in the honey. Instead of putting it in his mouth, he offered it to the man. He said to the man, the only way to, ex to know what the honey is really tasting like is to put it in your mouth and taste yourself. Ah, there's a wise lesson in it. The only way to know how Jesus tastes is the bread of life. Is to try it out yourself. If you do not do that, you are a lost man. You will never know how it really tastes to be a Christian. May we all taste that honey which the Lord has prepared for us.
That's His sweet life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God and Heavenly Father. Again, Lord, we come before you in Jesus' name. I'd like to thank you, Father, for the prayer of David. You know now, Lord, the way how we can reach heaven. It's by counting on your promises and confessing our sins and doing the work of Jesus. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are not mighty, not powerful to do all the things. But your promise is that I can do all things in Christ Jesus with strength. And here I am, oh Lord, here we are, kneeling down before you. Ask your blessing for the coming week, where we will meet new challenges. Oh Lord, help us out. Let your presence not run away from us. But rather, Father, let the presence of Jesus accompany us. And whatever we do, Lord, whatever we think, will be according to thy will and will be pleasing. So, Lord, bless each one of us. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In Jesus' name. Amen.